And uh, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Romans chapter 12. And we're going to begin there right at the beginning of Romans 12. Uh, So as we come to this chapter, we are kind of coming around the final bin, to use a running analogy, of the book of Romans. Uh, We looked at Romans chapter 1 through 3. It was kind of the introduction kind of summarized in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We went through Romans 4 through 8, where Paul tries to understand how our faith, the same faith that Abraham had, applies to our life practically. We're no longer enslaved to sin. We're no longer defined by our relationship to Adam. We're no longer bound by the law. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we are sons and daughters of God. Then in Romans 9 through 12, we see Paul seek to explain how God remained faithful even in the face of the Jewish people, by and large rejecting their Messiah. But now, as Paul has explained God's sovereignty, as Paul has explained the gospel, the good news that is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, Romans 12 is in a sense a holy wake-up call. And uh, as we've gone through Romans chapter 1 through 11... Romans 1 through 11 has a lot of very terse, dense material uh, that's, that's kind of hard to explain and honestly kind of hard to understand at times. But as we come to Romans 12, Romans 12 is not going to be uh, theologically complicated. In fact, it's going to be really, uh, it, it's going to feel more like getting into a boxing ring than it is sitting down in a classroom. And here's why. Because Paul has now turned the page and he's going to focus on the practical commandments and the practical walk of what it looks like to be a Christian. Now, as we look at Romans 12, it's going to be pretty obvious that Paul gives a list, a long list of commandments. Do this, don't do this, be like this, don't be like that. Uh, But as we think about this, we need to remember what we talked about going all the way back to the introduction of Romans. And it's this, that Paul was ministering not in a vacuum... But he was ministering in a very particular context. And the context was there were Jews, there were Gentiles, there there were those who had been used to to keeping commandments and following God's laws, who had to understand what that's like to then be with Gentiles who knew nothing of God and nothing of his laws. In other words, the context for Romans is how you have a Christian community, one body of Christ, with very different people groups making up that one body. In other words, Paul isn't just saying, here's what it's like to be a good person, do this, 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 and this. No, he's coming at it from the standpoint of Jesus making into one a diverse group of people. Some who were wealthy, some who were poor, some who were highly educated, some who were not educated, some who were Gentile, some who were Jewish, some who had standing in society, some who didn't, some who were slaves, some who were free. And Paul is trying to look across the board and say, in Christ we are one And therefore, this is how we are to live. So Romans chapter 12 is a major hinge. And really, from this point in the book of Romans, there's going to be no looking back. It's going to be focused heavily on application, heavily on commandments, but always rooting those commandments in the gospel, in what Paul has explained through these first 11 chapters. So let's dive into it. Romans 12, we're going to start in verse 1 and 2, because as often happens, when an author starts a new section... Oftentimes they give kind of an umbrella uh, overlay of what's going to be then worked out and fleshed out in the remaining section. In other words, there's an introduction even to miniature sections that we need to pay attention to. And that's what we're going to do in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So these first two verses, notice that he begins, therefore. And the therefore there is incredibly important. It links Romans chapter 12 with everything that's already come in Romans 1 through 11. Therefore, in view of God's mercies, Paul is saying, in light of all of the things that I have laid out before you, the mercies of God, therefore, he says, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? This is a powerful and kind of a provocative image, right? 
because a living sacrifice is an oxymoron. A sacrifice, by definition, is dead. And yet Paul says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. And as we think about that, it's really pretty clever, isn't it? Because for Paul, the cross is not only the means by which we obtain salvation, but the cross is also the way that we are called to live and follow after Christ. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Die to your old self and live in the newness of life. So Paul, in giving us this image, says, I want us to live. I urge you to live as a living sacrifice, daily dying to your own flesh and instead living for God. But it says holy and pleasing to God. And think of why sacrifice is such a pregnant image. Because when you think of a sacrifice in the Old Testament sacrificial system, a sacrifice had to be what? Pure. It had to be holy. And so Paul says, if we're going to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, we also need to live holy lives. Now, as we, as we think about Paul's logic here, what Paul is trying to get us to see is Christians are not called to be holy for the sake of being holy. Christians are not called to be good for the sake of being good. And, and just think about this in a, in a kind of a practical context. Do you ever talk about someone and say, you know what, that person is just a good guy. You know, I, I actually say that fairly often. If there's someone uh, that, that just strikes me as a good guy, that's how I describe them. That person's just a good guy, or that person's just a, a good woman. And we all know what we mean by that. You know, we use phrases like this, they do anything for you, they give you the shirt off their back. You know, if I called them up at any time, they would come and they'd be right there. And listen, that's, that's, that's appropriate and good. I'm not saying that's bad. But we tend to think of goodness apart from the gospel. And that's what Paul is trying to get us to, to come back and say, wait a second, when we think of what it means for, for someone to truly live out a life that pleases God, it has to be a life that's lived in view of the mercies of God. It has to be a life that's lived intentionally putting our lives on the line as a living sacrifice. Now, is it possible to do that without that being in the forefront of your mind as you're doing something? Of course it is. But a life that's transformed by the gospel is not just a life that does random good things. It's a life that sets its trajectory and says, I want to make it my aim to live holy as in my personal holiness. I want to walk with God free of sin by the power of his spirit. But then also, I want my life to produce good works or good deeds. This is what Paul, by the way, says to the Thessalonians. He says, keep on doing what you're doing, but to an ever increasing degree. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this, he says, is true worship. You know, when, when, we think of, when we think of worshiping God, especially as you read the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament prophets are keenly aware that there is a possibility and a temptation for people to come into the presence of God, whether it was in the temple or otherwise, to come into the presence of God to proclaim praise, to sing praise, to offer praise, but for God to utterly reject it. Here, here would be the modern day equivalent. That it would be possible to go to church, to have an incredible worship service, you know, be moved by a sermon, and to leave church with a sense of like awe and wonder and like, man, you felt the, the power of God today. And for us to leave and for God to be like, you know what, that repulses me. In fact, here's, here's, what, uh, here's how Amos describes it. Amos says, and, and this is in Amos 5, Amos says, you bring your sacrifices, you, you bring your offerings, but meanwhile, here's what I'm doing. I'm blinding my eyes to what you're doing, and actually, as you praise me, I'm plugging my ears, is the image that he uses, because he says, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear your false worship if you come in and what you're doing is offering praise, but meanwhile you go out and your life is far from following me. I want you to live a life that demonstrates your praise. That's why, notice again, this is your true worship. True worship is laying my life down and not coming in in a moment or in an hour offering some type of ritual to God. No, the Bible says that's more about you than it is about him. But rather, he says, I want the true worship of a life that has died to self and is living for me. A living sacrifice. But he goes on to say, 
This is your true worship. Do not be conformed. And notice this. Paul says, do not be conformed to this age. But rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Paul uses in various places the language of being delivered from one age to another. This is something we've talked about before. We see it at the beginning of Galatians where he says he's transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He talks about this in Galatians, the same kind of imagery. He talks about this in the book of Romans. First John talks about this, by the way, as well, that we've been transferred into the kingdom of God. So as we think about this language, Paul is essentially saying there is a kind of wisdom or a kind of way of life that the world sees and the world uses and then there's a kind of thinking, a kind of reform, reforming that happens in our mind as we seek Jesus so that ultimately, if we're following Christ, we are going to see things fundamentally differently than the way the world sees them. But here's the trick. Paul says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. You know what it means to be conformed? It means that eventually, over time, your thoughts, your emotions, your heart are shaped more by worldly wisdom than they are by biblical truth. And unless we, let, unless we kind of allow ourselves off the hook here, I, I, I go back to what James says. James says that there is a wisdom that, that he describes as a wisdom of this world. And, and here's why he describes it as wisdom. Because it really does seem wise. It really does seem to make sense. There, there's a reason why there are many people who claim the name of Christ, but whose lives are utterly far from God. Why? Because it's easy to be conformed to the wisdom of this world. It takes intentionality and effort in order to have a mind that is renewed. And notice, notice Paul, doesn't, Paul says your mind needs to be renewed. In other words, you need to, to go back to the way you think, the way that you see the world, your worldview, your vision. And you need to constantly be reminding yourself of what is true and what's right. And we're going to see, as Paul gives this list of commands, we're going to see that when it comes to following God in this way, it's usually not complicated, but it's often very difficult. Let's just give one example. Worldly wisdom says, look out for yourself. If someone hurts you, robs you, mistreats you, hurt, rob, mistreat them back, at the very least, have nothing to do with them. But what does Jesus say? Love your enemies. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. If, someone, if you lend to someone, give to them without requiring them to lend it back to you. If someone takes your clothing, offer them the rest of your clothing as well. Paul says, whenever someone wrongs you, don't, don't seek vengeance against them. We're going to look at this in a minute. In Romans 13, he's going to say, the governing authorities, obey them. Pay your taxes. Paul says to the Thessalonians, uh, we want you to live quiet, peaceful lives so that the gospel may be spread. Again, these are not complicated things to understand. But they're very, very difficult. And they're very difficult. Why? Because it's easier to be conformed to the pattern of this world than it is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus, you know, Jesus' problem was, was not really that he was difficult to understand. Jesus' problem was that he was too clear to understand. And yet, truly dying to yourself and then, think of this, a living sacrifice is someone who what? Places their hope, their future, their plans, their life in the hands of God. A sacrifice offers itself to God and says, God, I'm going to trust you even when your ways seem wrong to me. Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. You know, it's, it's very interesting, but there are a number of, of verses that, that talk about this principle. It's understanding what God desires for us is not something that, that happens automatically. To, to understand the will of God, and, and please hear me, 
In a, in a sense, God's will is easy to understand. Love your neighbor, love God. Paul's going to talk about this in, in this chapter and the next. You can summarize it, you can simplify it. But at the same time, when it comes to walking with God, it, 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 it's kind of like marriage, just to use an analogy. In marriage, like you know what your spouse likes when you get married, usually. But is it not true that over time you continue to learn your spouse to a greater and greater degree? Right? Where it's, it's not just like you, know, you, you learn really what they like. You learn really what they want. You also sometimes learn what they do not like and what they do not want. And this is kind of the give and take. I love it. Uh, Tim Keller is a famous pastor in New York City. He, he kind of uh, quibbed this one time and I just thought it was funny. He said, you know, uh, my wife has been married to four different people <laughs> over 40 years. And he said, they're, they're all me. You know, but over the course of that 40 years, I became about every 10 years, there was kind of like a, a change that happened. But here's the thing. When it comes to following God, it's by renewing our mind. Look at what it says again, that we may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. I was talking to I was talking to someone. This was several years ago. Uh, he was a relatively new believer. And, and he, he was on fire, you know, had that kind of like fervency and zeal, of like, I want to follow God. And, and we were just talking and, and I was trying to just kind of disciple him and walk him through kind of a, a, a biblical picture of, of the narrative of scripture and how it culminates in Christ. And, and anyway, as, as he was just pouring out his heart, he said, Tim, like, I want to, I want to just, I want to have it all. I don't want to have it right now. And I said, man, I totally get that. And that's a great place to be. At the same time, what you've got to learn is the Christian journey is a marathon, right? Like growth does not happen instantaneously. And what you've got to do is fertilize the soil so that in God's timing and in his perfect way, he's going to bring about the growth. But here's the key. We have to put ourselves in a position where we constantly seek to discern God's will and discern what pleases him. And then as we get closer to God, guess what? It, it's, kind of like a, it's kind of like peeling back the layers where God is constantly peeling back layers in our lives. That, that this is a paradox in a sense. But the, the more that we learn of God, the more we learn of his holiness, the more we learn of his grace, the more we're going to see our own sin. And then the more we're going to see our own sin, the more we're going to be thrown back on the mercy of God. And then the more we're thrown back on the mercy of God, the more we're going to receive his forgiveness, which in turn is going to make us worship and marvel at him even more and even more. John Calvin, actually, his institutes, uh, he begins with that principle. He says that knowledge of God and God's holiness results in us being more aware of our own sin, which then results in us being more aware of God's grace, which then results in us being more aware of God's holiness, which then results in us being more aware of our own sin. And the Christian life is just this giant cycle of God is glorious and great. I am a sinner who needs him. I worship him and I see how glorious and great he is. And then it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Paul says the same thing. We renew our minds constantly, continuously, so that we continue to move, to grow, rather, in knowledge of God's grace, in knowledge of God's goodness. And by the way, you never graduate from that school, right? It's kind of frustrating. Don't we all wish we would graduate? No, there's only one graduation ceremony, and I hope that you don't desire that right now. We're all going to graduate someday, but until then, we discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God the process of it. Paul then moves on. So he says, for by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Notice the transition that takes place here. Paul now is going to go in view of the mercies of God, in view of the grace of God. He says, okay, now I want you to think about the way you relate to one another. The way that you think about yourself, but not just yourself in isolation. How do you think of yourself in relation to the other people around you? Again, very practical, very important for the early church to be able to come together. And of course, still practical, still important for Christians today. 
You should not think of yourself more highly than you should. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. We're actually going to talk about this more uh, in the sermon on Sunday, but comparison always robs us of joy. Have you, have you found that to be true in your life? And comparison, uh, like, I, I mean, I literally am going to talk about this on Sunday, so you'll get a double dose, I guess, on Sunday. But uh, when, when we think about comparison, whether it's, whether it's, wow, comparing myself to someone that it's like, I feel like I'm, I'm doing better than they are, or whether it's like, man, I, I feel like I'm, I haven't quite attained that height of spirituality. Either way, it robs us of joy. Like the Bible never says, compare yourself to someone else so that you get an ego or you have a false sense of guilt. Instead, we are to see one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Indefinitely, he says, no one should think of himself more highly than he should. Why? Because God has given a measure of faith to each one. And then Paul uses his famous analogy. By the way, it's kind of easy to remember. If you remember 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12 is Paul's use of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians. Romans 12, he uses the same image. He doesn't quite develop it to the same degree. But in Romans 12, we see the same thing. Now, as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, think of the brilliance of this analogy just for a minute, the body of Christ. First of all, it's, it's brilliant because it puts Christ where? As the head. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. Christ is the head of the body, which means what? He controls the body. He gives power to the body. He gives life to the body. He gives direction to the body. He is the reason for the body's existence. And as, as you just think about the human body, right? You can survive without a lot of things. You cannot survive without your head, right? Everything flows in and out of the head. Now, Paul uh, was not a physician, right? Paul doesn't have the advantage of modern science, but he really hit the nail on the head, right? You see what I did there? You see what I did there? There we go. <laughs> That's my poor attempt at humor. <laughs> no. Uh, the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the body. But the, the reason why this analogy is so powerful is because it places us within the body, at which point he says there is difference. Every part of the body has a different function, but also there is dependence. Because for a body to function properly, each part has to recognize its difference, but also to do its part. Notice what he says. In the same way, we who are many, lots of variety, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. He's going he's gonna to talk about this when he gives the commandments here in a moment. But all of the commandments that we're going to read in Romans chapter 12 and really all the other commandments of the New Testament are commandments that are built upon the premise that we are members of one another. That when one person weeps, we all weep with them. When, un, when one person rejoices, we rejoice with them. That we do not find our significance in our spirituality alone, but rather we are designed and intended to function as various people connected together. And this is, I, I would just... I don't want to overstate, I'm a pastor, so I, you know, kind of comes with the ter territory. But honestly, this is, I think, one of the fundamental problems with the way that we do Christianity in, in North America in the 21st century. It is that we tend to think of our faith as my personal walk with God. And of course, is our faith our personal walk with God? Yes. But the analogies that Paul uses are all analogies of us coming together. We're the body of Christ. We are the temple of Christ, right? We are all being built up together so that if I conceive of my walk as somehow independent of you, I have misunderstood what God is doing through the church. We have got to come to a better degree of understanding of what it means to be a part of the body, members of one another. Now, we might be able to say, well, guess what? The, the toe it might not be integrally and immediately related to, say, like the arm. But at the same time, we're all part of one body. In other words, that, that, that might have just crashed and burned. Here's what I mean. You might be more distantly connected to some parts of the body than others. But we're still connected. 
And this is how Paul wants us to see each other. Think of it in terms of Jew and Greek. Think of it in terms of slave and free. Think of it in terms of male and female. Think of it in terms of rich and poor. Think of it in terms of whatever you want to think about it as. But Paul says fundamentally we are one in Christ, connected to Christ, and therefore accountable to one another. And then Paul does this. He says, not only are we to think of one another, as he says in Philippians, as more important than ourselves, put the needs of one another above our own needs. But Paul here is now going to say, and by the way, as members of the body, Christ has given each one of us spiritual gifts, and these gifts are given to you, but they are not given for you. God has given each one of us a spiritual gift, but he has given it to us in order for us to use it in order to bless and build up other people. And this is where, again, Paul comes back and says, hey, don't get, don't get trapped in, well, my gift's better than your gift, or my gift's more visible than your gift, or my gift's more important. No, Paul says. The Spirit is the one who gives the gifts for the building up of the body. The Spirit is the one who made us. The Spirit is the one who saves us. The Spirit is the one who endows us with that gift. But, but please, we're going to look, look at it in just a second. Please understand, spiritual gifts do not create some kind of stratum of spiritual importance. No, God has given you something so that you can then use it to bless others. And look at this. Look at the gifts that he mentioned. Verse 6, according to the grace given to us, we don't earn it. It's not our ability. It's given by God. We have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching and teaching, if exhorting and exhortation, giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. Notice that every one of those gifts is a gift given in relation to other people. You prophesy to other people. You serve other people. You lead other people. You show mercy to other people. You give to the needs of other people. All of those gifts are community gifts. Given to individuals, yes, but so those individuals can serve the body. And, and by the way, that's what's the motivation. If my gift is given to me in, in, in order to serve others, then my motivation doesn't become, well, I want to exercise my gift so that Tim can somehow be exalted or so that you can somehow be exalted. No, I want to use my gift to the best of my abilities with the grace that God gives me. Why? To maximally bless the people around me. And again, th this is where it's so, so easy to have a worldly view of our Christian service rather than a godly view. In other words, it's so easy to be conformed to the pattern of this world because the world says, if you've got a gift, a talent, an ability, use it for yourself. Climb the ladder. Get the acclaim. Get the fame. Do it for you. Whereas biblically, it's exactly the opposite. If you've got something that God has given you, don't use it for yourself, use it for other people. And by the way, this is, I, I really believe, this is one of the reasons that we, we see so much burnout among Christians, but also, I guess I'll just say it like this, we need to rediscover the joy of serving other people. Most of the time, we, we, we think, we, we even kind of catch ourselves coming into this. And of course, no one would say it like this. But we almost begin to think, well, I'm good with serving other people 90% of the time, as long as I can just get like 10% of the spotlight. Or I'm good with kind of like meeting the needs and, and serving other people, as long as at some point I get a pat on the back and some recognition. Now, please hear me. Please hear me. We're going to read in just a minute that we are supposed to outdo one another in showing honor, which means part of that is showing appreciation, showing gratitude, showing thanks. But it's... <laughs> Sorry, these are funny things that are coming to my mind as I'm talking. Ways that the Lord impresses these things on me. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus for just a second. Uh, maybe in a way that you can appreciate. So this is, this is how this works in my life. When I think about this, uh, sometimes I do well in thinking, okay, you know, my goal is to put my kids above myself and put my wife above myself. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to do that. I want to make, lay down my life for them. Sometimes I do a really good job at that. But there are other times that it's like, all right, I'm going to do this until I can hold on and get some me time. You know what I'm saying? It's like, all right, 
when the kids are in bed, the kids are in bed, time for some me time. Or when, you know, Melissa and I, if we're talking at night or whatever, it's like, okay, she goes to bed, some me time. And listen, I'm not saying me time is bad. We need to be able to refresh. I am an introvert. I recharge by being by myself, right? Okay. But here's what I'm saying is that sometimes rather than it being a, a genuine, non-selfish self-care, other times it can be, I want that time. Here's how it kind of worked in, in my house for a while. Uh, I, would, I would sometimes be like, all right, I'm, I'm waiting until a time when I can go take a shower because in the shower I can just sort of like just process and my mind just, you know, it's like for whatever reason, it's like privacy, alone, shower, okay? But here's the thing. In my house, showers are not always private, right? So it's like there was a particular time where I'm like, all right, I'm closing the door. I'm out of here. You can do it by, you know, and I don't know if my kids were, I don't remember the context, but it was like, I am about to have a selfish moment and indulge my selfishness. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is about me now. And so I'm in there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm in there. It's like I'm taking a shower. And then all of a sudden, someone comes in. I don't remember what it was. I'm just like, why are you here? What are you doing? Because in my mind, I had completed my mission of putting other people before myself. It was something that I checked off to then get to the deeper desire, which was what? Me. And this is what we had. And this is, this is why I laugh. When we think about this, Paul is not saying, I want you to exercise your gifts 99% of the time for other people so that then one day you can truly get the, you know, the, the applause that you deserve. No. This is truly dying to that desire. This is truly getting so close to the core of who we are that it's like, you know what? Instead of loving my kids and my wife until the time when I can truly focus on myself, it's learning that true joy comes in not focusing on myself at all. And again, there's a difference. I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. But if, if you make yourself an idol, you're going to miss the point of the whole thing. Paul uses this in terms of spiritual gifts. <clears throat> gifts are given to each one of us for the benefit and the building up of other people. Now, this is where it can get really fun. Because God gives us all different gifts, doesn't he? And all of those gifts are necessary. All of those gifts are important. Paul, in his discussion of spiritual gifts in, in 1 Corinthians, he actually brings it back to love. You know the famous love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13? And what does he say? If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I'm but a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Or if I'm able to comprehend all mysteries and have all knowledge, but I don't have love, then I have nothing. If I give my body to be burned, or if I give everything I have to the poor but don't have love, then it means nothing. And here's his point. We can do a lot of things that on the outside might seem very sacrificial, kind. But if they're not motivated by love, then ultimately they're not profitable for us spiritually. And, and we don't think of it like this, but honestly, if it's just a masked form of selfishness, that's not pleasing to God at all. If I'm just doing something to be seen doing it, then that's not true service. And of course, that's, that's something where the mind games just go crazy, right? Because who has not been in a position where it's like, man, I'm doing this. I sure hope you see it. You know, Melissa, these dishes were dirty, but by golly, now they're clean. You better see how much I love you. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so silly when you say it out loud, but it's so real, right? I'm doing all this for you. Yeah, well, apparently not. And God's not fooled by that, is he? He's not. And listen, God is gracious, right? God is kind. God is able to take even, even that, that mixed bag that is almost always our heart. But our goal is to go to God and say, God, please search me and know me and see if there's any hidden way in me. Or not hidden way, any wicked way in me. And then lead me in the everlasting way. We go to God and God graciously, kindly, remember, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. 
Paul gives us gifts that we are to use for each other. Just as a, a, as a word on this, this list is not exhaustive in uh, Romans 12. And here's how we know definitively that it's not is because Paul gives various lists of the spiritual gifts and they don't exactly match each other. In other words, you, sometimes, and this is not bad, I'm not against this, but some of you, like me, have probably taken like spiritual gift surveys, right? Where it's like there's all these lists of spiritual gifts and then you kind of rate yourself on each one and then you see what your spiritual gift is. Those things can be helpful, but I'm not one who believes that even you put all the New Testament together and that's an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts. I don't think that's how God intended it. So your spiritual gift may not be on the list as it were. Now, some people want to take that to an extreme, like my spiritual gift is gardening. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, you may love to garden uh, and can you, you know, I don't know. You, you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, I don't think you can just make up my spiritual gift is, jug gift is juggling. Okay. You know, I guess you can come do the devotion at Upward, but, uh, but truly, here's my point. Spiritual gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, not always, oftentimes they might match our personality and complement our own natural gifts that we have as people, but not necessarily. And when it comes to spiritual gifts, by the way, uh, there, we can't use spiritual gifts as an excuse to say, well, because I don't have this gift, I, I don't have to therefore be this way. The Bible talks about the spiritual gift of discernment. The Bible talks about the spiritual gift of evangelism. Okay? There are some people who are gifted to be very discerning. There are some people who are gifted to be very good at evangelism. But no one can raise their hand and say, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism, so I guess I'm off the hook. Or I, I don't have the spiritual gift of discernment, so I guess I can just go around, you know, believing lies all the time, right? That's not how it works. But that's, that's at least part of the purpose of saying God has given us people with the gift of discernment to help those of us like me who don't have it, right? I, 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 trust me, I am, I am probably one of the most gullible people you'll ever meet. Uh, I, don't, I don't even want to give examples of that because they're embarrassing, right? <laughs> but we need each other, right? We need each other. And we need the gifts that God gives to, one, to each one of us, okay? So let's go to verse 9. We're now about to hit the barrage. And I'm just going to read through these. And really in your notes, I just listed them. Uh, and then we're going to kind of come and, and try to circle around uh, 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 categorizing these gifts and trying to understand the logic of where they're coming from, okay? But let's just read through it. I'm going to read through the end of the chapter. Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, don't avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it's written... Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will heap fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. So Paul, he, he just rapid fire, right? Commandment, 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 commandment. Now Paul in the next chapter is going to come back and he says, listen, when it comes to these things... I'm trying to give you not a list of commandments like in the Old Testament where in this situation, here's exactly what you are to do, but rather these commandments, notice, are all rather general in nature, right? Don't cling to evil, cling to what's good, rather general. Outdo one another in showing honor. Well, how do we do that, Paul? That's why the Holy Spirit lives in you. Work that out in your own life with your kids, with your marriage, with your job. Here's your principal commandment and now go work it out, Okay. So notice that these are all kind of general in nature, but also notice how relational all of them are, right? Most of these commandments uh, entail that there is relational, uh, that there are relational dynamics that we need to 
uh, use the gospel to think through and apply. Okay? So let's go back and just, just read a few of them. Let love be without hypocrisy. Some translations will say, let love be genuine. Here's what that means. Christianity is not a fake it till you make it kind of love. And this is really, really hard. Uh, because sometimes it's just easier to fake it. Let's just be honest. Like sometimes it's just easier to pretend like you're actually caring for someone when you're not. That doesn't please God. Um, now, I will say this. Being kind is much better than not being kind, even if you have to sometimes grin and bear it, okay? I'm not saying, well, if, I'm, if it can't be genuine, then I might as well just let loose. No, that's not good. That's not right. But the goal should be, if I'm not feeling genuine love, Lord, bring my heart to genuine love. Uh, I don't remember, it may come to me in a minute, I don't remember where I read this. Uh, actually, no, it was Tim Keller, again, uh, it was Tim Keller who said this. He said, you know, it's really hard to be angry long term with a person that you're praying for. Why? And, and he, he was talking about prayer in particular, but he said, here's why. Because if you're praying for someone, prayer is built on the entire idea, idea that I'm not worthy to come before God and speak, but because he has forgiven me, I can come by the blood of Jesus. Okay, well, if that is my heart as I go to God in prayer, and my heart is suffused with forgiveness and grace, then it's going to be really hard to stay angry with someone for a long period of time if I'm actively praying for them. Now, I'll be the first to admit, it may be hard. It's not impossible. <laughs> but it's a lot harder, and this is, this, is, this is what I try to do. I mean, there are times when, uh, in, in particular, there are times when when there are relationships in my life that, that bring about anger in my heart. They do. Uh, and, and a lot of times it's because of Christians that I feel like you are not acting in a Christian way and it makes me angry. And so what do I have to do? I have to go before God and I have to, I have to remind myself, okay, whether it's loving this person as an enemy or loving this person as a brother or loving this person as a neighbor Whatever it is, whatever category I'm putting them in in my mind, the call is always the same, to love them and to pray for them and to pray maybe that God opens their eyes. But the, the prayer is that there will be no root of bitterness in me as I engage with them. Love can be genuine uh, without always feeling lovey-dovey, okay? But... Let love be genuine, detest evil, cling to what is good, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Again, Paul is building off the analogy of the body of Christ. If we are part of the body of Christ, this is how we are to treat one another. If we are members of one another, this is how we are to relate to one another. Which is why he goes on, don't lack diligence and zeal, be fervent in the spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, persistent in prayer, share with the saints in their needs and pursue hospitality. This is kind of crazy to think about in some ways, but Paul's vision of the church was that the relationships between believers would be so compelling to the outside world that they would be drawn to worship and follow Jesus based on the way that Christians treated one another. Now, in our minds and in our culture, it's kind of like this. Well, uh, if, if I feel mistreated or if I feel somehow like, like, and, and, like we just kind of separate. Well, I'll just never talk to them. Or I will, and, and listen, there are times whenever there's real and genuine hurt that's deep and calls for separation. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, we, we do need to rediscover a vision of Christianity where, and Paul's, Paul said this in this chapter, right? As much as it's up to us, we live at peace with all men. Now, sometimes it's not up to us. Sometimes... Those relationships can't be reestablished or restored. But as much as it's up to us, we've got to be willing to, again, put ourselves on the line as a living sacrifice and say, God, I want to please you with the state of my heart. The relational context is absolutely 
crucial. Live in harmony with one another, verse 16. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. That's the idea of empathy, right? Um, th there's, a, there's a lot of, this is, may sound strange, and some of you may not be familiar with this. There's been some controversy in the last like four or five years among Christians as to whether or not we should have not sympathy, but empathy, right? Some Christians would argue, well, sympathy is good and right. You want to be able to say, well, if you're hurting, I want to comfort you in that. But they would say empathy is not in every case what we want because empathy means essentially putting yourself in their shoes in a way that you feel what they feel. And, and honestly, I think that, really, that debate is really pretty silly, just to say it bluntly. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice is, is the idea that we do enter into the pain and the hurt of others. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus did, right? I mean, you, you just think of the example of Jesus going to the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus knew that in 10 minutes, Lazarus was walking out of there, right? He knew it. That was his whole plan. And yet, Jesus allowed himself to be so overwhelmed, not with his own grief, but with the grief of those around him. And some people are naturally like this, right? You, you ever have someone who's a crier? You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention Larissa just because uh, she's not my wife. So, hey, you know, go ahead. Um, no, Caleb said one time, he said, Valissa, or not Valissa, Larissa is a crier. Valissa is not a crier. Larissa is a crier. And here's what he said. Whether she's happy or whether she's sad or someone else is happy or someone else is sad, the tears just flow, right? Others like me, it's kind of like, I'm sorry you're sad. Oh, man, you know, uh, you know it's, it's harder for me to empathize in those ways. Not that I don't feel it on the inside, but sometimes showing it doesn't quite catch up. But here's the point. That's why we need the body, right? We are a family. And are there weird people in the family of God? Yes, there are. Are there weird? Yeah, okay. Are there weird people in your family? Yes, there are. Do you always like the people in your family? Probably not. Are you always going to like the people in your church family or in the body of Christ? Almost definitely not. But that's, and truly think about this, that's where the gospel has that much more opportunity to shine. Because the gospel can truly unite people who otherwise would have no reason on earth to know, like, associate with each other in any way. But as it, at its best, the church brings together people who otherwise would be at each other's throats. Notice what he says. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. This is where we have to be conformed, right? Flesh, repay evil for evil. Renewal of our minds, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. This is an interesting and I think important principle. Um, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's the guardrails against the mentality that, well, I'm living to please an audience of one. I don't care what anybody else thinks. And basically, if God tells me to do it, then who cares what anybody else says? There's truth to that, right? If God says do it, then we're called to do it, come what may. But Paul says you are to give careful thought to do what's right in the eyes of others as well. In other words, it's not an either or, and that's how some people treat it. Well, I'm only going to care what God thinks, and I'm not even going to consider what it looks like to other people. That's wrong. Why? Because again, it's not, put, it's, it's not considering the needs or the thoughts of other people. This is, by the way, going to be the foundation of what Paul's going to talk about in Romans 14 when he talks about the freedom that we have as Christians, incredible freedom, but also the principle of putting the needs of others ahead of our own. But Here's, here's what Paul is saying. Give careful thought to do what's honorable. And I think about this. Uh, I think about this um, when it comes to church finances, honestly, is, is where it comes to mind. And here's why. Because Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul there talks about collecting a gift for the saints in Jerusalem. You probably have heard of this, right, where he says, I want you to be ready when I come so I don't have to extort it from you. This is the famous text where God says, God or Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. 
Paul there is collecting an offering for the saints in Jerusalem. There was a famine in Jerusalem. They really needed food. And so Paul, in his mind, said, if these Gentile churches give their money, then the Jewish churches are going to recognize the brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ, and God's going to be glorified, and the need's going to be taken care of. So he says, awesome, I'm collecting this special offering, and therefore I want you to be generous. But here's what Paul says. When When he details how they're doing that, he says, we want to come, we want to collect the offering, but he also says, we've brought along people with us who the sole purpose, it seems, of them coming along is just to make sure that the money is taken care of. And here's what Paul says. He says, we want to be careful to do what is right before God and before men. Now, was there any question as to Paul's integrity? No, there wasn't. Paul knew that he was above board. Paul knew that everything they were doing was was transparent and God-honoring. But here's what he said. He said, it's not enough that we honor God. I want to do everything that's possible to do right before God and before men. Which is why when it, comes to, when it comes to stewarding the resources that God gives us, I want to do right before God, but I also want to do right before men. So that if anyone has any question about anything that we do, that there's not some kind of undercurrent of like, oh, something's hidden or something's shadowy or something. This is why, like, and, and I think about this every time we have a trustees meeting. It's not just about getting to the right place. It's about getting to the right place in the right way. It's about doing the right thing in a way that honors God and is right before men. Paul says the same thing. Be careful, he says, to give thought, to do what's honorable in everyone's eyes. It's possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, don't avenge yourselves, but leave room for God's wrath. Again, this pushes back against our natural way of thinking. We want to avenge ourselves. We want to protect ourselves. But God comes back and he says, leave room for me. So there's a lot of different commandments and we, we didn't go through them all, but, but my, my point in, in uh, just going through the ones we did is to bring out some general principles. And here they are. Paul's vision is again, not just a list of do's and don'ts. Paul's vision is how do we relate to one another as believers? This is why, by the way, there are so many one another commandments in scripture. So here's what we see. First, the commandments assume a context of persecution and opposition, don't they? Right? When someone does evil to you, don't retaliate. When, when st- cling to what, is e- to what is good, but don't cling to what is evil. When someone persecutes you, what does he say? When someone curses you, don't curse them in return. Um, I'm going to find this first. Rejoice in hope, verse 12. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. The Christian life shines out the brightest when Christians are persecuted. Now, listen, does that mean we desire persecution? No. Does that mean we pray for persecution? No. But please make no mistake. Christianity is as a faith is most powerful whenever it costs you to be a Christian. This is, by the way, why the early church just spread so rampantly in the Roman Empire. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it was Tertullian. He was an early church father. This was a couple hundred years later. Eventually, there was a major uh, major Roman persecution of Christians, and I think it was Tertullian who came up with this quote that's that's often cited. He says this, the blood, uh, he says, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. In other words, he found a pattern that whenever the faith was persecuted, it actually thrived to a much greater degree. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That is not conforming to the pattern of this world. That's being transformed. If you can look at your enemy who is persecuting you and look at them and say, you know what? Rather than seeing you as my enemy, I'm seeing you as someone who needs the gospel of Jesus Christ and not saying that in a like, you've heard the song, I've quoted this before, right? I'm praying for you. I pray your tires go out at 110. You know that whole song, right? No. It's like I genuinely care about you. My enemy who hates my guts, I genuinely desire God's grace and mercy in your life. That's a supernatural work of God. Jesus says it like this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, anyone can love those who love them back. The evidence of God's supernatural work is when you love those who hate you, which is, of course, what Jesus did. 
whenever on the cross he said, Father, forgive these very men who are killing me, crucifying me. So there's a context of persecution and opposition. Also, the commandments are primarily about the ways that we relate to one another as Christians. Paul, again, is going to summarize in the next chapter, love God, love your neighbor. If you follow that, you're going to follow the law. But Paul gives particular commands. Why? So that we don't let ourselves off the hook. The Christian church is to look different. And then also, the assumption of this text is that the Spirit is producing these works in us. And here's, here's what that means practically. We can't just wake up one day and say, you know what? I want to be kind and put the needs of others ahead of myself today. What we have to do is we have to go to God and say, God, by the power of your spirit working in me, change my heart. Help me to truly care about others more than I care about myself. Help me, please, transform me. Peel back the next layer of sanctification that needs to happen in my life. And as we do that, God will be faithful. This is why, again, going back to the principle, don't be conformed, but be transformed, continuous, by the renewing, continuous of your mind, so that then you're able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. This is Paul's vision. He gives commandments, but again, these commandments are not in every single situation. This is exactly what you are to do. We're called to work that out and walk that out. Which is why, again, we're thrown back to, to the gospel. We're thrown back to the Spirit. But thankfully, according to Paul, the Spirit lives in each one of us. And he will show us the way. So this is Romans 12. Tons of commandments. Principles that we can all follow. Paul's going to get to some, some really interesting conversations in Romans 13 about government, other things. Romans 14, freedom in Christ. But any questions you have as we kind of turn the hinge uh, to the very practical applications in the book of Romans. Any thoughts, any questions? It, it's a challenge, isn't it? Like it really does almost seem impossible. But it is impossible apart from the grace of God working in us. And yet truly, like, have you noticed this? True joy comes whenever you die to self, right? And, and that's, what I, that's what I try to remind myself of when I get into a very selfish frame of mind, which I do, and we all do. What I try to do is remind myself what I'm feeling right now is not true. Why? Because what I'm feeling is, well, if I become selfish, that's the way for fulfillment, satisfaction, and joy. But of course, selfishness never leads to satisfaction and joy. It just leads to more misery. You just happen to be miserable without other people around you. Or you're happy for a period of time until you get to the point where you're miserable again. True joy comes in, in taking up our cross and following the way of Jesus. Uh, so it's not impossible through the power of the Spirit working in us. Any, any final thoughts before we dismiss and move on? Yeah. Um, what, what are we missing to make it be like that we are walking more like the epistle Paul was writing? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It's a huge question. But I think, I think maybe the most fundamental answer that I know to give is we need to stop thinking about the faith in consumeristic terms. And what I mean by that is our culture is constantly bombarding us with this thought of here's what you can do, consume, in order to make your life better. And unfortunately, Christianity has bought into that as a marketing strategy almost. Like here's what you can read or the Bible study that you can do. But here's, here's what we all know. There's a huge difference in doing a Bible study by yourself versus doing it with a group of people. Or there's a huge difference in going to church by yourself versus going and actually communing with other people. 
Now, here's what I don't have a great answer to. It's not just what happens in the church. Our culture as a whole is incredibly isolated. This isn't just a church phenomenon. This is just America in the 21st century. We tend to spend a lot of time by ourselves, whether it's, whether it's working by ourselves or doing things by ourselves. Uh, we need community. And of course, in the last five years, especially with COVID, that was just exasperated, right? Where we're forced to be alone. And then we all realize this wasn't good for anyone. Like, and, and COVID, and I'm, listen, don't hear me. I'm not, like, I get social distancing. But you know what I'm saying. There is a psychological impact that goes beyond the, the physical. And, and I think just, I think fundamentally, it, it's, it's just having a different target as Christians and saying, our goal is not to get in, get out, get what I need and move on. My goal is to surround myself with people that I can, that, you know, do life with, not in a cliche kind of way, but like truly, it's not just a Sunday school class. It's not just a connect group. It's someone that I can call and say, man, I'm struggling right now. Will you pray for me? Will you help me? And honestly, just knowing that those people are there sometimes is its own gift. Um, but yeah, I, th I think not looking at the faith primarily in consumeristic terms, because again, a consumer by definition is most concerned about themselves. But that's a huge, huge need. It really is. All right. We are over time. Uh, Romans 13. We're going to get through Romans. We're going to do it. Unless Jesus returns, which he may. Uh, but we're going to do it. All right? Yeah.